In this video, we'll be taking an in-depth look at the second level of the GTO Check Solver dashboard. This level coincides with the second level of the GTO Check Blueprint's tri-level system, the Mesoanalysis, where the goal is to simplify GTO by crafting strategies for groups of hands that share similar strength. But before we get into the nuts and bolts of this intermediary level, it will be helpful to set the stage by briefly revisiting the first level of the tri-level system, the macroanalysis. As a refresher, in the macroanalysis, we consider position, range advantage, and SPR to evaluate the tendencies of our range as a whole. The simplest strategy that we can devise is one in which we are able to use one blanket strategy for all the hands in our range. However, outside of limited scenarios, such as when we're in position on the flop with a strong range advantage throughout the range, or when we're out of position and our opponent bet on the immediately prior street, in most situations we cannot play our entire range the same way without significant EV loss. So in these scenarios, we need to break up our range into smaller pieces and then craft different strategies for each of these buckets. Poker AI systems have been utilizing bucketing based on hand strength for over a decade because, as we'll see, hands that share similar strength will often share common incentives. And when hands share common incentives, they can often be played the same way without major EV loss. Every single player in the world, whether they are conscious of it or not, utilizes bucketing in one way or another, and GTO Check is the first system that allows users to bucket hands in a systematic, customizable, and quantifiable manner, which we will describe in this video. In order to utilize buckets effectively, there are two primary steps which must be taken. First, we assess which bucket or class our hand fits within. This exercise entails evaluating where our hand ranks among Dylan's equity distribution. Second, we select an action based on the incentives for the designated hand class, that we believe will maximize our EV against targeted regions of villain's range. This process greatly simplifies our analysis in two ways. One, instead of having to balance our entire range and consider all of the possible incentives that hands within our range may have, we can focus our attention only on the select incentives that are applicable to our specific hand class and achieve balance by simply ensuring that there are a sufficient number of combos within the same bucket that can play in accordance with our preferred incentive. Secondly, after we've identified the applicable incentives of our hand class, to estimate the action that will maximize our EV, instead of having to construct and consider a villain's entire range, we can hone in on and target select portions of villain's range that are relevant to our preferred incentives, because hands with common incentives tend to derive EV from similar regions of villain's range. To explain further, let's begin by discussing the first step of the mesoanalysis, assessing where our hand ranks against our opponent's equity distribution. An equity distribution is simply the dispersion of all of the hands a player is likely to have at a given spot. We can visualize an equity distribution as a vertical spectrum, with the bottom of the spectrum representing the worst hand villain is likely to have, and the top of the spectrum representing the best hand villain is likely to have. And our objective, when trying to define which class our hand belongs to, is to try to accurately assess where our hand stacks up against this spectrum. If our hand is ahead of most of villain's range, our hand is likely in the nuttish class. A shorthand method to assess this is by counting backwards from villain's strongest possible hands downwards until we reach our hand. The fewer number of combos that we can think of that villain is likely to have that we are behind, the more likely it will be that our hand is in the nuttish class. So for example, here we have a 6 max 100 big blind scenario where the button opened 2.2x and the big blind called and the flop was queen jack 8. And let's assume that the button is holding pocket 8 for bottom set. Where does this hand rank in the big blind's equity distribution? Well, we know that the button's set is strong, so we can just assess the button's equity distribution given the board from top downwards until we reach bottom set. And this equity graph can help train our ability to do this on the fly. This chart plots each hand in both players' ranges by their equity on the y-axis. The proportion such hands make up of villain's range is plotted on the x-axis and we can brush these hands with our mouse to filter them within the dashboard. 
So for example, in this spot, if we want to see what percentage of the big blinds range has equity of 70% or more, we can just brush the chart along the Y axis above 70 and we see that hands with 70% equity comprise the top 85th percentile or so of the big blinds range. Comparatively, hands with 70% equity comprise the top 65th percentile or so of the buttons range. This means that the buttons range is significantly stronger at the top part, and we can see why this is when we explore the heat map, which has now been filtered to show only the hands with greater than 70% equity. And if instead we want to see what type of hands comprise the bottom 50th percentile of the big blinds range, we can just brush along the x-axis below 50, and we see that the weakest 50th percent of hands for the big blind have equities ranging from around 10% to 40%. In contrast, the weakest 50th percent of hands for the button have equities ranging from around 10% to around 60%. So overall, the button's range is stronger throughout, which explains why the button has significant overall equity and EV advantage, and is doing a significant amount of c-betting on this flop. And so to see where the button's pocket 8s stack up, let's click on pocket 8s in the heat map to isolate them. And now we see that pocket 8s are the only hands filtered in the equity distribution for the button. To get a better look, we can zoom in on this region by simply brushing the zoom bar below this chart. And now we can brush upwards in the scatter chart to identify hands in the big blind range that have higher equity than the button's pocket 8s. Now as previously discussed, we need to keep in mind that equity is determined on a hand versus range basis, not a hand versus hand basis, so sometimes these results may be a bit skewed when the ranges are asymmetrical, but this data will still be useful in most scenarios. So in this case, the big blind likely has some straights with at least 10-9 off, other hands which potentially could be ahead of the button here given the board include queens and jacks, but these hands are pretty unlikely since most competent players will be 3-betting these preflop. So in all likelihood, pocket 8s are only behind straights, which means that they are ahead of the entire rest of the big blind's equity distribution and can probably be safely categorized as a nuttish hand. The next tier down are mid-strength hands, which are ahead of most of villain's range, but also behind a significant portion of villain's range at the same time. For example, let's assume that instead of pocket 8s, we're holding something like queen 6 of diamonds. Although this hand is ahead of a lot of weak hands and junk in the big blind range, it's also behind a number of hands as well. Right, we're behind straights, pocket 8s, queen jack, queen 8, and jack 8 2 pairs, and then a number of stronger top pairs with better kickers or that also have flush draws. Realizing hands are likely behind most of villain's range, but ahead of a significant portion of the range as well. This class may include a hand like pocket 7s, which is ahead of the big blind's trash, and also some hands with moderate equity like ace-9 and pocket 5s, but it's behind many combos as well, including top, second, and third pairs, as well as pocket 9s. And finally, non-realizing hands are behind the vast majority of villain's range. You can identify hands in this class by considering if there are any hands in villain's range that our hand can beat at showdown. If the answer is no, then it's likely a non-realizing hand. So for example, a hand like 6-4 of spades is realistically no better than the absolute worst hands in the big blind's range, so it very clearly is a non-realizing hand. We should note here that although we've pointed out a few examples of how specific combos fit within our broad hand classes, we need to be careful that we do not extrapolate these classifications across all possible spots. Where a hand ranks in villain's equity distribution is 100% dependent on the context at each decision point. For example, if our opponent has a very tight range, it will usually mean that our hand needs to be very strong to rank high along this spectrum because a tight range tends to have less fat. And when our opponent has a wide range, it will usually mean that the same hand will be ranked at a higher percentile because a wider range will typically have a lot of fat. The reason for this is because there are only 5 community cards at most, so the likelihood of such community cards interacting significantly with a range which may span 13 different card ranks is relatively low, meaning that when you add more and more combos to the range, it tends to have a dilutive effect. This is why the exact same combination on the exact same board may have a much different equity profile all depending on the width of villain's range.
For example, Ace Jack suited held by the button in our example has over 72% equity. However, this same exact hand on the exact same board held by the cutoff in a button versus cutoff 3 bet pot has less than 56% equity. Remember, equity measures the likelihood of a hand winning against the opponent's overall range, and since the button's range in a 3 bet pot is much tighter and stronger than the big blind's range in a single race pot, the same hand on the same board will have very disparate equities vis a vis the opponent's range. So now that we've established how to allocate our specific hand to a broad class based on its strength, what do we do with this information? Well, as we covered extensively in the last video, we can greatly simplify this very complicated game when we're able to devise overarching strategies for groups of hands instead of attempting to devise unique strategies for individual combos. And the benefit of classifying hands based on their strength is that hands of similar strength tend to share common incentives.